Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Victor Fraga, and we are at the Brazilian Embassy in London. We just finished watching Rat Fever, which is one of the most provocative and audacious Brazilian films made in the past 10 years. Um, it was made in uh, 2011 by Claudio Assis, and it's a fiction movie, and it deals with sexual freedom, anarchy, how to reconcile um, artistic freedom with, uh, with personal freedoms. It's a very, very powerful film. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with some very, very special guests. Uh, I've got uh, over there Jean Willis, which most of you will recognize. He's, um, Jean Willis is a Brazilian congressman. Uh, he's easily the most, um, the most vocal uh, the most vocal person for LGBT rights in Brazil. He stands for uh, a lot of minorities, um, and it, I would also hazard a guess, um, I'm of the opinion that he's one of the most important LGBT personalities in the world. Um, we've got right here in the middle, Brian Robinson, who is uh, the programmer at the uh, BFI Flair London LGBT Film Festival, the largest LGBT film festival in the UK and uh, probably one of the most important ones in the world. Uh, and I've got Lucien Ajibi here, who is a professor of film studies uh, at the University of Reading. Lucia is originally from Brazil. Lucia is probably one of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to cinema I've met in my entire life. So, <laughs> so I don't want to get into too much detail with her because she'd probably or oh, uh, a big new experience, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, these people uh, one or two questions. Um, we've got a beautiful and amazing audience in here, and they will have the opportunity to ask a few questions as well. Um, I'd like to start with, um, with Jean. Jean, we watched a film uh, about sexual frankness. People living out, enjoying life, having sex as they wish, disregarding social conventions. Uh, Brazilians are not used to this level of sexual frankness. Uh, I don't think we're going to see this film on, on TV Global in Brazil. I don't think uh, uh, it's uh, too audacious, too frank. Likewise, Jan, uh, in Congress, um, you ha you've always been very frank about your sexuality, about being LGBT. Many people are not comfortable with that. We had a conversation yesterday that um, not going to mention names, but there's a lot of politicians who are not frank about their sexual life, and therefore they feel uncomfortable with your, the frankness in your life. So my question to you is, are Brazilians not prepared for artistic and sexual frankness, both in cinema and in politics? Obrigado, Vitor. É, boa noite a todas e todos. Eu quero agradecer o convite para participar dessa conversa sobre esse filme. E eu vim aqui por conta de uma atividade no King's College. E, na verdade, esse convite foi me feito depois e eu aceitei, porque eu sempre gosto da oportunidade da gente refletir sobre a vida a partir do cinema. Eu sou, como diz Roland Barthes, esse sujeito que vos fala gosta de sair do cinema. Vitor, é, a sua pergunta é uma pergunta instigante, busca fazer uma ponte imediata entre o filme e a minha atividade. Mas antes de responder essa questão específica, eu acho que o filme é mais do que sobre liberdade sexual. Para mim, é, o, que, o filme é um contraponto entre o lema positivista da bandeira brasileira, ordem e progresso, uma oposição entre ordem e progresso e liberdade e anarquia, ou sexo e anarquia, para usar as palavras do poeta. E esse lema positivista, ordem e progresso, não deixa de ser o lema das sociedades capitalistas, liberais e neoliberais, que transformam os homens e mulheres em máquinas de produção, em sujeitos autômatos que produzem, que produzem, que consomem, é, tirando, retirando deles a liberdade, inclusive a liberdade sexual. E nesse sentido, o poeta e sua trupe de anarquistas, que também se confundem com os supérfluos do capitalismo, os pobres, os excluídos, os que estão no mangue, nos, estão nas favelas, os que estão nas palafitas. É, de certa forma, eles são o contraponto dessa ordem. Eles oferecem uma outra ordem de mundo, que é uma proposta de liberdade, inclusive de liberdade sexual. Para uma ordem, é, 
e, e que quer produzir progresso dessa maneira, nada pode ser mais subversivo do que o sexo. né? É, Para usar uma frase de uma de um escritor brasileiro que eu nem gosto muito, jornalista, mas ele produziu uma peça interessante junto com a Rita Lee, uma canção chamada Amor e Sexo. É, amor é prosa, sexo é poesia. Então, o sexo é algo, de fato, é uma força de um desejo, é uma febre. É quase uma febre do rato que se espalha e que afeta a gente como uma doença e desconstrói essa ordem. Por fim, é, o meu olhar como um ativista de direitos humanos e como um parlamentar eleito hoje, que busca apresentar um outro modelo de atuação política, é, eu, eu tenho uma atenção sobre esse lado da vida. A minha atuação política está voltada para essas pessoas. Não sou anarquista, mas eu me interesso por essas pessoas, pelos supérfluos do capitalismo, pelos excluídos e pelas suas possibilidades de resistência. Então, eu como político, para ficar na metáfora do poeta, em vez de me interessar de condenar os pobres a uma eterna reciclagem do lixo, eu prefiro transformar os pobres em diamantes a serem lapidados. Esse é o meu trabalho. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jan. I'm going to direct my next question to, to Brian, who, who is, um, uh, we're very glad you have a British voice in here. Um, and uh, I've observed um, how, how the British perceive Brazil, Brazil. and um, in my view, but it's your view I'm interested in, obviously, uh, but I'd like to point out um, the British people, or Europeans in general, often take a very colonial view on Brazil, uh, they think it's very libertarian, not just in the sexual sense, but in the political sense, uh, everything is very free. I think, um, I think that's a, a misconception. I don't think Brazil is as libertarian as, as Europeans normally see. So my question to you is, um, how did you see this film? Is this the libertarian Brazil which you, uh, which you often Imagine, is this the kind of libertarian Brazil audiences in, in the UK would, um, would expect to see? Or is that a, a very awkward Brazil? The film is, is fascinating to me because it feels almost like, a, in a sense, a time capsule. Um, that it feels very anchored in the 1960s and some of the revolutions that went on in culture and society then. That's not to say that it's an antique. Um, in the film, they talk about hippies several times and there was a whole movement across the world in the 60s and 70s where people were trying to create new ways of being and it was particularly strong in America, but it spread worldwide. And I was very struck by the notion of the charismatic leader, um, the artist trying to create new spaces, which reminded me um, very much of a wonderful Brazilian documentary that I saw called Z Croquettes. And um, another film that actually I was surprised to see Hilton Lacerda on the credits, uh, his film Tatuagem or Tattoo. And seeing the films makes me think that Brazil must be an incredibly advanced um, culturally and on the verge of some great kind of breakthrough um, that it's, it's very bold, very dramatic um, and makes Britain seem very pale by comparison in many ways. But I realize from your question that perhaps um, these films and these people are the exception rather than the rule. Um, I mean, I'll say in defense of the British view that the colorful excitement and the exoticness of, of Brazil in its many different forms is something that feels, from a gray London perspective, a, a thrilling th thing. And, um, it can't be, since the British never owned any of Brazil, it can't be that, that kind of colonial um, as aspect of owning something. Um, but I was very interested in actually why they chose to make the film in black and white. Um, was it self-conscious artiness? Is that another look back to the 60s? Because actually the camera work is very beautiful. A lot of the images are amazingly beautifully composed. Um, 
I thought it was also very interesting that nobody looked at mobile phones in the film that I could see at all, um, although it's maybe it may be supposed to be set in the present of, of 2011. And it was, I mean, very heartwarming to see that old people can have sex, um, that it's something that isn't often portrayed in cinema. I'm sure it does happen all the time. Um, but the way the world works, you'd think that it was only the youth that, that were interested. Um, I mean, it feels like the film is really provoking a whole debate about what it is to create art and society. And well, I said it was a time capsule, but actually it's just as relevant today. Um, how do we live? And when he was pointing up at the, the people in the buildings, saying they are the pigs and we live underneath them, um, it, it really resonated because in London we are going through a moment where there are many people in very beautiful buildings um, but where are the spaces for the people who don't fit in, the people who are self-consciously activists or artists and want to create new spaces? Do they have to go to the coast? Is London no longer a place um, for artists and people who have little money? I mean, it's a huge issue that I think is affecting people across the developed world and beyond. Um, if capitalists want to create a society where money is the main thing. I mean, the great thing about the hippies was that they created an alternative society. Um, in the, There was a drag group a bit like Z Croquettes called the Coquettes in San Francisco. And they were part of 400 communes in San Francisco that the Coquettes who were gay drag communards um, they supplied drag. Other people supplied food or vegetables or plumbing or roof mending. And there was a whole non-money-based society that flourished for a short time. Um, but maybe I've said enough already and I'm dying to hear what um, our Brazilian cinema expert. Mm, wonderful to come after you because um, you, you almost stole the words from my mouth because actually there is this kind of time capsule we are going back and i think this is quite uh, conscious and and purposeful on the part of the filmmaker um, and your point about the film having been written um, in partnership with Hilton Lasserre de Chico Sá so it's uh, Claudia Cis, Hilton Lasserre and Chico Sá they were actually looking at an era which is not actually the 60s but just after that, the, the early 70s um, and a bit, uh, and the, the kind of movement that was known as Tropicalia, um, and um, referring back to an era um, post-utopia, uh, uh, post the teleology of history as Ismail Xavier has um, defined it, um, that is to say, after the military coup, um, and then the recrudescence of the military coup. Uh, so the military coup was in 1964, and then in 1968 there was the um, Constitutional Act Number no. Five that uh, um, closed the uh, political liberties completely. So this film is political. Uh, in every respect, um, and th the way that it reacts against politics uh, um, of the day is not the today politics, it's the politics that goes back to the military uh, dictatorship, and it's almost directly citing uh, Glauber Horsch's Antonio das Mortes, if you've seen this film, with the um, Independence Day parade on the streets. Uh, that is a scene that comes straight from uh, O Dragão da Maldade contra o Santo Guerreiro, uh, Black, um, Antonio dos Mortes. And um, so the boots of the military on the street um, and the, 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 the opposition forces, all these uh, people have, who have been left out 
of uh, the uh, privileged classes that were kind of uh, um, benefiting from the coup and the new order that had been established um, um, clash at this moment. In Global Horsha, it's the poor of the Northeast. And in this film, it's again the Northeast, but not the Sertão, not the uh, interior of the Northeast, but the, the people from the coast. Uh, so it's Pavel and Sertão, the, the territory of poverty that is being focused on. Uh, but um, it, um, Claudia sees in this film is going back also to the experiments um, about the body, the politics of the body that was carried out by people like uh, José Celso Martínez Correa and the theater Oficina. It's a politics of exposure, of um, taking out the veil, removing the veil, exposing the body, and using the body as a tool, as a political tool. So it's a commitment on the part of crew and cast of being the characters that they are portraying. It's not representation, it's presentation. It's, um, we can see that those people are naked and what we see, the organs that we see are their organs. There is no, there is no stunt, no dubbing, nothing. They got in trouble at the police where they were, where they were filming. Yeah, so, and the intervention that they make in the city is also yeah. real. Yeah. Um, so... It was real trouble when they got... Yeah, so, um, in, um, I call this um, a kind of attitude, not just in this film, I never wrote about this film, but this film goes back to that kind of attitude that I described, and you commented on, um, on the realm of the senses, Aino Corrida, because there is a kind of ethics um, that is embraced by these filmmakers of acting, of performing in reality what they represent in the fiction. Um, it's a kind of intervention in the real um, that, um, that requires a commitment from the, the, the actors, the crew, the, the cameraman who's turning, Walter Carvalho, extraordinary picture um, of, of photography that he produced there, uh, turning around. And that, again, is very Glauberian, that kind of um, gyrating camera. It's very much to the... Yes. Lucia. It's interesting you, you start talking about it. I'm gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna pick your brains a little bit because obviously you know a lot about cinema. First, I'm gonna make one little, my little view on this film. I, I, this film, Rat Fever, is about go, uh, is about insanity. It's about extreme, uh, the board uh, negotiating freedom with insanity. It's about, it's often related to heat. The, the film often alludes to, to, to heat, so it heat got to your head. So I, oh, that reminds me a lot of, of the film, I don't know if any of you have seen Dog Days by the Austrian filmmaker Ulrich Seidel, where people go completely insane uh, due to the heat. And likewise, we're experiencing uh, the hottest day of the year in London, a very hot day. Uh, no one has gone insane in here, which, uh, which, is, which is a good sign. Um, but, um, so there is a, a very strong connection between in insanity, uh, extreme love, extreme freedom. So I want to ask Lucia, I know Lucia um, studied Oshima quite a lot. I think you did your PhD on Oshima, didn't you? Uh, the Japanese director of Aino Kurida, which uh, for, me is a no, uh, for me is one of the most important films of my life. It's a film which also deals with um, extreme love, extreme freedom. That it's, um, it's also very sexually ex explicit. Do you see any parallels uh, between Aino Corrida? There's, there's animals everywhere. A dog day is about dogs. Rat fever is about rats. Aino Corrida, a Corrida is a Spanish for bullfight, a realm of the senses, so it's the bull. Um, do you see any, any connection? Um, can you comment a little bit on that? Well, uh, as we were talking about the, this politics of the body, uh, the, the politics of, of um, um, unveiling um, uh, bearing your your body, uh, showing uh, what is inside. This film is all about the uh, viscera, going inside the bodies, going inside the river, going uh, under the bridges. So it's all 
to do with looking at the inside of people. So I think that the, um, it's very much in tune with Oshima and in tune with an era with the 70s, because Oshima was only able to do this film because censorship had been abolished in France. Uh, so until then, there was very tough um, censorship on uh, erotic, eroticism on the screen um, and um, uh, the kinds of politics that you could talk about or not talk about, etc. But uh, at the moment when um, censorship was abolished, then Anatole Doma, who was a film producer in France and a mecenas of cinema, funded a number of masterpieces in the world, um, he invited Oshima to do a, a, an erotic film uh, because he had seen some of uh, Oshima's previous films and thought he can do it. And he asked Oshima to make it as explicit as, explicit as possible and uh, to do the real thing. And that for Oshima was kind of reading his innermost desire because he had always wanted to do it. But obviously there were enormous barriers in Japan for him to do it. So uh, the arrangement was for him to shoot the entire film, uh, no, in Japan, but then do the post-production in France, edit. So he smuggled the negatives to France and all the process of development and, and um, uh, editing was done there. Um, so uh, this film is very much in tune with that era of, um, on the one hand, the recrudescence of dictatorships in Latin America and on the other, um, experiments in arts that were extremely libertarian. Um, for example, the Living Theatre in New York with Bob Wilson. Um, uh, everywhere in the world, um, after the fall of that communist project that had, uh, had uh, fueled so many revolutionary projects across Latin America, in Brazil, every, all the left wing thought that we were going to have a socialist revolution. There were all the the um, the project, the CPC, the 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 projects with the peasants in the northeast. Uh, Eduardo Coutinho was filming there. All the the hopes were that we are, were going to have a revolution, and instead, what we had was a military coup that was. Uh, strongly supported by the middle class. It's very much like Brexit here, you know. How could we go so wrong uh, expecting one thing to happen and it was exactly the opposite? So there was a, a, a total misunderstanding of the, the society that those people were living in. Uh, and after that coup, so these people could obviously not overnight start supporting a very repressive regime. They went to the opposite side and proposed um, a complete liberty, uh, cannibalism of all the arts. For example, intermediality became uh, the word of the day. Um, if you think about Caetano Veloz and all the experiments uh, that happened in Tropicalia, so there were no more barriers between popular and high culture, no barriers between the sexes, gender, no. So all experiments uh, were valid because Cinema Novo was still, and all the, the left wing project was still very elitist. It was um, very male centered. Um, there were not much space for women and so what we see after that in terms of gender, in terms of this pan sexuality that we see in this film, all happened there. And Brazilian society went through that peak of uh, libertarianism and then went down and you were quite right that today it, this film is more shocking than it would have been okay. probably yes. in the 70s okay. you know the story doesn't go straight up it, it, it falls uh, full of ups and downs so that's where I think those two kind of films communicate okay so I'm gonna ask Eugene one last question and I'm gonna open uh, the microphone to, to the public so John we have um, Brazil is is a young democracy that, that we, we we saw uh, uh, that's not exclusive to Brazil, but we're seeing a shift to to the right. 
Uh, Brazil is, is currently experiencing a, a lot of changes uh, in the political landscape. Um, and and we're, we're moving further to, uh, to the right. So my question to you is, how does, how does this impact um, artistic freedom? Uh, does that impact artistic freedom at all? Eu, eu escrevi o prefácio do livro de uma filósofa brasileira chamada Márcia Tiburi, que escreveu um livro de muito sucesso é, lá no Brasil e já está traduzido em cinco línguas, chama-se Como Conversar com um Fascista. E nesse livro eu recorro a Hamlet, quando na imagem de evocar espectros diante de velhos fantasmas. Isso porque eu acho que, como a história se movimenta numa espiral, quando ela faz uma volta, ela repete alguns aspectos. É, tem gente que fala em pendular. Eu prefiro... Porque pendular me parece uma repetição absoluta. E eu não acho que a repetição é absoluta. Eu acho que é uma espiral, repete alguns aspectos com, com, com diferenças. Então, velhos fantasmas que nós julgávamos sepultados com o processo de redemocratização do Brasil, e a Constituição de 1988, a Constituição Cidadã e as diretas já, ou seja, fantasma de autoritarismo, de controle, que a gente julgava sepultados, eles reacenderam com muita força na nova república. Então, toda a riqueza do Brasil que foi celebrada pelo movimento tropicalista, por exemplo, que antes celebrada pelo movimento de 22, o movimento modernista, toda essa riqueza que os, os países de fora tanto aplaudem e admiram, essa riqueza cultural está ameaçada por essa nova hegemonia política. E aí, nesse sentido, é, diante desses fantasmas, espectros têm que ser evocados. Então, Hilton Lacerda, é, Cláudio Assis, mas também uma turma de novos cineastas, como Daniel Ribeiro, é, citar quem mais que eu acho relevante, Karim Ainos, Karim Ainos, é, o Sérgio Machado, enfim, eu tenho uma nova turma de cineastas e uma nova turma na música, recuperando os espectros que já que foram, que estiveram presentes na semana de 22 e depois reencarnaram, reapareceram durante o tropicalismo e agora reaparecem. Okay, well, I'm going to take um, a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so, uh, could you... Uh, And that you're gonna, could you pass the microphone on? Uh, uh, that lady and that gentleman there. Uh, hello, and um, thank you uh, for the debate and for this really dirty movie that we've seen. I would like to, talk, to ask the BFI. Um, Brian. Brian Robinson. Brian. Brian Robinson. Um, uh, we work with cinema, but we want to broadcast and talk about all those subversive and thought-provoking cinemas. Uh, do you think that uh, with the Brexit now, there will be a change in funding uh, films in Britain? Because of what we hear is that there will be cuts. And um, I'm living here for five years, and I think this is an amazing place to watch and and discuss cinema. But I'm a little bit afraid of what's next. Do you have any perspective? And, and uh, sorry, and building on that, if you could also comment whether that could affect exhibition as well, whether that could, that could affect Brazilian films being shown here. I think that it's clear that leaving the EU means there will be less money because the funds will be coming from the EU will not be going into um, film production and many different structures that there are in the film industry for supporting uh, like Europa cinemas, um, producer training, script writing development, many, many things um, will have to be done in a different way. Um, the BFI Lottery Film Fund um, is actually very secure um, so that's the good news and we are completely committed to maintaining um, a high level of British films 
We introduced diversity standards that we require um, a certain level of diversity either from the people who are making the film um, or the storyline that it's very important that um, films that are made reflect all of our culture um, across. Um, it's very odd that Brexit is being mentioned um, within the context of this film because it does feel, um, and I hope one is not being alarmist, that there is, it's a, a sort of a, a tipping, a potential tipping moment um, that in the elections that saw Adolf Hitler brought in in the 1930s, um, there was a hugely vibrant um, culture that was just as excessive and radical as anything that we've just seen on screen, if not more so. Um, and so I think we've all got to be very aware that actually politics doesn't just belong to elected politicians, that we have to be very vigilant about what goes on um, and know that people power does have an effect. Well, that, that's probably not the official position of the British Film Institute, but <laughs> it's something I felt I had to say here. That's fine. Hello. Um, I'd just like to say that the movie, um, if it was no black and white, it would not be so beautiful. I think it's so provoking, it's really provoking. Um, living here for 10 years and see Brazil like that is kind of a little bit shocking. Um, my question is, um, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to speak in Portuguese, I'm going to give some words for the translator. Minha pergunta é para o Jean, eu sou brasileiro como você, eu sou gay abertamente como você, sou ativista da forma que eu posso ser como você é, e eu gostaria de perguntar para você como ser humano, não como celebridade, não como político, um, você vê essa realidade é, de que vimos retratada da forma que o cineasta quis retratar. Você vê isso um futuro? Você vê isso como um futuro? É, como o cineasta fala, é, independência e sorte. Será que isso faz parte do nosso futuro como brasileiro, das crianças que estão aí? Talvez sua, sua resposta vai ser... Não é isso que a gente quer, mas será que a gente vai viver isso? Será que a gente, justamente baseado no, no, na política que está aí hoje em dia? <risos> Vamos lá. Eu não sei em que país você vive, mas no país que eu vivo, as coisas... E aí eu vou fazer uma distinção da sua pergunta, certo? Para mim, o filme não tem nada a ver com o que você pergunta, e eu, mas eu vou responder a tua pergunta. É, no país em que eu vivo, um país é, de dimensões continentais, com mais de 200 milhões de habitantes, complexo, desigual, um país com um passado de escravocrata, de escravidão, de exclusão dos negros, das mulheres, dos espaços de poder, de violência contra a comunidade homossexual histórica, Nesse país, há garotas de 13 anos engravidando precocemente porque trepam em bailes, bailes funks com dois, três homens numa mesma noite. É, só para completar rapidinho, é, e também não há no filme nenhuma criança representada. Todas as pessoas são adultas e capazes. E pessoas adultas e capazes devem gozar das liberdades sobre os seus corpos, das liberdades individuais, sem que o sistema e o Estado intervenha, inclusive com violência física, sobre elas. Não deixa de ser curioso que um contraponto interessante do filme é o incômodo que a nudez do casal, Eneida e Ziso, é, provocam nos policiais. Quer dizer, é, há, uma, há uma inversão de valores. Como é que a tortura, matar um homem e jogá-lo no rio, torna-se algo tão aceitável diante, simplesmente, da nudez. E, só para completar e completar mesmo, tem uma frase do Caetano Veloso, que é importante trazer o Caetano Veloso, porque a, a Lúcia citou a Tropicália e tal, tem uma frase dele ótima, que eu quero deixar para você. Enquanto os homens exercem seus podres poderes, índios, padres, bichas, negros, mulheres e adolescentes fazem o carnaval. All right. Well, um, everyone... 
unfortunately, we need to, uh, we need to wrap up. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up. Uh, it's because of time. One I would. One question for Eileen. No, 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 no. no. It, it's fine. I, I would love to stay here all night and, and debate. Uh, it's uh, it's been a very hot discussion. It's been very hot weather. It's been a it's been a lovely evening. Uh, we have. Three fantastic people who share their experience and their views with us. This is this has been invaluable, uh, and Dirty Movies would like to take the opportunity to thank the Brazilian Embassy for this amazing opportunity. Well.